Gregor has an amazing story. I don't know how much of his background he's going to tell you, but he read a book, moved to Singapore, started trading silver out of his, uh, well, at a train station, actually, with rich people who wanted to buy silver, and then said, um, I should start my own silver facility. So I went and toured it about nine months ago. Um, it's one of the best quality facilities in the world, and it's soon to be the largest in the world. So. Uh, I want to present to you Gregor, and he's going to talk to you everything about silver and gold storage. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we just came in recently out of Singapore, a uh, long flight. But maybe before I start, I'll give you just a quick background about myself. Uh, I actually, uh, I'm German originally, but I only spent eight years in Germany, 12 years in Italy, 12 years in Oceanside, California and uh, 10 years in Singapore, two years in London. So a lot of different places. And since I was quite young, I was interested in finance. So I decided to get a finance degree, an economics degree. Ended up working for uh, stock brokers, ended up working for uh, quants, a structured product desk of banks building derivatives, and sort of went through all of that. And in 2008, I had an aha moment. Um, which maybe a number of you also had, which made me very, very interested in precious metals. Uh, at the time, I was working as a senior data architect for uh, Commerzbank, uh, Germany's second biggest bank. And Lehman Brothers uh, basically declared bankruptcy. And I pretty much saw the aftermath of that in the trading room of a bank. And I got to realize um, that the whole financial system is based on trust. If bank A does not trust bank B with a transfer of cash because it might go bankrupt and so cash might be gone forever, they will not trade. If you do not trade with some of the derivatives out there, the whole system is going to collapse. And we got extremely close in 2008 of having a complete collapse of the system. Hence the need for bailouts and so on and so on. But I have to tell you, it scared me. And it scared me because the problems which caused 2008 have not gone away. I was mentioned earlier that you know a lot of these loans that banks have are not marked to current valuations, marked to market. There's a lot of junk out there. A lot of these problems are just being papered over, and we print more and more money. And at some point, that bill is going to come. And when I was standing there in the trading floor, I just recently had read uh, Mike Maloney's book, you know, investing in gold and silver. And I kind of scratched my head and said, "Oh, that might be a good time to go and buy some gold and silver." And by the time I thought it made sense to do so, I couldn't get any. Every bullion dealer in Frankfurt said, we are buying gold, silver, we are not selling because we are sold out. I went to the bank, same story. I finally got a one kg silver bar from the gift shop of the European Central Bank. I paid 90% tax, so I brought it to Singapore, paid another 7% on import. Um, but I bought it at $9.50. No, but the interesting thing is, physical at the time, if you go to uh, eBay, it was selling at $35. It was very hard to get physical. And that's when I realized there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between physical and between the paper price. And that has everything to do with the amount of trust in the system. If you don't trust that your bank might still be around tomorrow, then all that money in the bank is basically worthless. So if you look at Cyprus, if you look at Greece, you know, people might have $100,000 in a bank account, but you can only get $50 out of the ATM every day. In Italy, they have uh, cash rationing right now. You can only get about 1,000 euros per week, regardless of how much you have, because the government is trying to cut down on, on uh, under the table uh, payments and so on. So the point being is we are going to have another crisis. This crisis might be a lot worse than the, next, than the last one. And there might not be the political will and or enough money to bail out the banks again. So what we're probably going to see is bail-ins instead of bail-outs. And a bail-in means people who have money in the financial system are going to have to take a haircut. So based on all of this, I asked myself, what can I do to create a safe storage of wealth? Gold and silver made a lot of sense. Personally, I like silver um, more for various reasons than gold. So when I moved back to Singapore, where I have moved, I tried to find somebody who would sell me silver. And nobody was 
Uh, there was nobody who would sell silver. So I figured out, okay, let me get some silver from the US somehow, put it under my bed, put a website up with live pricing, because that's what I did professionally, and see if anybody is going to buy it. And you know, after $800,000 of sales, meeting people at the train station, giving them four bars of silver and them giving me $10,000, I kind of figured there is a market. Uh, it's time to put a little bit of money in, getting an office, getting some employees, and get the thing started. That was back in 2009. Since then, we sold around, uh, in US dollar terms, around $350 million worth of gold and silver. Uh, we are currently storing around $220 million. Um, about half of that is silver, half of, half of that is gold. So we're storing about 170 tons of the shiny metal silver. So the presentation today is pretty much to show you what I learned about securely storing something. Because last night I had a conversation with somebody who actually uh, stored gold with, with a different company and got burned. Uh, they never actually stored it. So, so there's a lot of funny things going on in this industry. And when we started this company, Silver Bullion, I made it my mission to start from a clean slate and build its processes, which are so transparent that it's impossible to cheat. And that's some of the stuff I would like to share in the first part of the presentation. On the second part, I'll tell you a little bit about our peer-to-peer -peer lending system, which basically allows you to get liquidity out of gold, as you buy it from us or somewhere else, by lending to a fellow customer uh, and completely cutting out the banks. So having said all of that, all of that let me get going. Um, Okay. Now, I didn't want to talk too much about why buy gold and silver, but I couldn't resist putting this in. Um, this, there are some graphics we commissioned, and just look at this bill, this $100 bill, as you all know. Take 100 of these, it's 10,000. Take 100 of these, you get a million. Take 100 of these, you get a pallet with $100 million. Now, if we put this to scale, you will find your pallet right down here. And this huge tower over here, that's $1 trillion. Because we hear you know, $1 trillion more in debt, but it doesn't mean anything to most people. It's too big a number. So we try to visualize it a little bit. And we try to visualize how much debt was added since 2008. And this chart is actually out of date. It's one and a half years old, or two years old. So, but the point being here is that we added more than, more than double the amount of debt in the last seven to eight years. So how long can we keep on doing this? And keep in mind that this chart does not include unfunded liabilities. Um, we don't have a, a, a funded pension system. We don't have the money to pay for Medicare, Medicaid, and so on. So that's another 60, 70, 80 trillion dollars on top of this. So this is a time bomb. At some point, something has to give. Another chart, which might be of interest, is where money is nowadays. Down here you have gold, and you get different asset classes going up. And <clears throat> the key thing I want to point out here is this. This is one quadrillion, and that's a rough estimate of how much derivatives we think there is right now, because nobody knows exactly. And, and these are, are basically bets between banks. And banks have all of these risk tools and, and uh, analysis and so on, and they basically say, oh, risk is very low because we are we're getting this derivative from this bank and this derivative from this bank and it's going to add up and our net risk is really very small. And that might all be true, but as soon as one of these banks disappears, you have an enormous amount of risk. Things move the wrong way, so banks are going to fall over and die. So basically, it's like a card house and you remove a few cards, everything collapses. This is why we have the too big to fail problem. This is why we had to have bailouts. And this problem is with us, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. So what I think is important for everybody, you don't have to store with us or something, but you have to be aware of these things, that it makes sense to take, say, 10 or 15% of your funds, of your money, and put it in something solid that's outside of the financial system that's also liquid. Hence gold, silver, and so on. Uh, that's a good choice. Now, if you store it in your own home, that's one issue. If you store it with somebody else, 
then you get into uh, a lot of stuff to watch out for. And typically, I tell people, you should watch out for four things. If you store with anybody, ask these four questions. How do I know the gold is actually there? How do I know that same gold has not been sold to 10 different people? How do I know that that gold is actually gold and not gold-plated tungsten? And how do I know that this gold has not been leased out to somebody else? And these are all things that happen. As well as how do I know it's not being used as inventory you know, by a bullion dealer. So the way we address these points is whenever we store something, we don't store by quantity. Uh, instead, we store by individual parcels. We call this segregated ownership. You have to understand that in this industry, oftentimes people say, oh, I, you own this and this. But technically, you can only own a specific item, a uniquely identified item. You cannot own 97% of a gold bar. That's an IOU. You're being owed, but you don't own it. You have to own the whole thing. So only one person who can own the whole thing. So that's an important distinction because as long as I owe you something, it's really on my balance sheet. Which means if I go under, you're out of luck. It also means I can do all kinds of things with that gold. So if you're going to store with somebody, try and make sure that you are the legal title owner of that. How do you do that? Well, in our case, you have a unique ID, and then we sell you that specific ID with an invoice. And an invoice is a powerful document. It, it legally transfers ownership of that parcel to you. Uh, now, in Singapore, if you falsify an invoice, there's criminal charges against you. So, you know, that makes the whole thing even uh, stronger. Given that we have all of these parcels, uh, we then list all of the parcels we have and we put them into a big list of around 300 pages or so. And we show each parcel, and next to it we show the owner, the anonymous ID of the owner who has it. And that's made available to all customers. And what this list does is it ensures that it's impossible for us to double assign a parcel to multiple people. You can download that list and you can check your unique ID and check against your serial number to make sure that you're indeed the person who bought the bullion. Um, that same list is also audited by our auditors, which is PricewaterCoopers and Bureau Veritas. Uh, these companies also do the physical checkup of the bullion. So uh, that happens four times per year. And you get a photo for each parcel. So that kind of answers the question is, how do you know it's actually sale? Of course, you can also come and do an audit yourself for each individual parcel that you own. We all just get it out of the, of the world for you. Second question is, how do you know it's not double assigned? Well, this list answer said, I'll be getting into the third part about testing uh, late in the presentation. And last but not least, how do you know we are not leasing it out or using this bullion for other reasons? Well, because it's not ours. We are um, an agent for you who stores it, insures it, provides liquidity. But it's your bullion. So if we were to take it and lease it out, it will actually be illegal, it will be caught stealing. Which is very different from us owing it to you. If we were to just owe it to you, we could do all of those things legally. Hence, if you do this stuff, try to become an owner. <coughs> now, <coughs> having said all of these things, I, uh, we set up the system and then initially we outsourced our storage to, uh, one, to a large international vaulting company. And our contract said this, and this is coming directly from uh, the contract. The vault shall not be liable under any circumstance whatsoever for confiscation, seizure, appropriation, expropriation, requisition for title of use, or willful destruction of the goods or portions thereof by or any government. Now, if you go all the way and for whatever reason you decide to store in Singapore, which I believe to be the best jurisdiction for storage, um, you sign a clause like this, what is it you're really storing it in Singapore for? Because the vault operator could, according to this clause, ship it back to wherever it needs to go, according to him. 
And of course, I wanted to get rid of that clause. But throughout the industry, this is a standard clause. There's no way of getting rid of it. The reason is <coughs> that the industry pretty much works this way. You have different dealers. And these are the ones you will be advertising and so on. And these dealers then subcontract to global vault operators. These are companies like Prinks, like Lumis, um, Mark Ahmed, and so on. These vault operators then operate in many different countries. Some of them are US-based, some are European-based. But a lot of people which are worried about systemic risk might come and say, well, I want to put my gold in a different jurisdiction because maybe we're going to have a repeat of what happened in 1933 when gold was nationalized. So I don't want it to be under US jurisdiction. Well, if you're throwing it with a global world operator who has US exposure, you basically end up being under US jurisdiction. That's why you have to sign that clause. And because I believe that it's very likely that we might have a nationalization again at some point, given the amount of debts that are being created, and the eventual need of maybe having a different currency backed by gold. Um, the only way for us to address this issue was to build our own vault. And that's how we ended up creating a subsidiary of the company, Silver Bullion, and we called it the safe house. So I've got a short video here. Let me see if I... Uh, my Susan, I might need help to start it. Can you start it at 20 seconds? So this, this will give you an idea. Yep, this is perfect. Also, so if you could turn off the sound. Mm. Oh, it's okay with sound too. Uh, this is a place. So it's secured by Singapore Auxiliary Police. And uh, you have also security issues, you know, man traps and so on and so on going in. But you can essentially store in two ways with us. One of it is safe deposit boxes. And we have two types. This is a small one, which is for gold. It goes in a class two vault. You can put about $600,000 worth of gold in here. Or you put it uh, silver, you can put in a big box, which holds around 6,500 ounces of silver. Uh, here you can see this is the entrance to the main silver vault. It's a two and a half ton door. And inside, all of the silver is stored into these pallet cages. They're about 900 kilogram cages, which hold individual parcels. And each one of them belongs to one customer, by number. Here you see safe deposit boxes um, in the class one vault. Here you're coming into the class two vault, which is a vault within a vault. That's where the gold actually goes. <coughs> uh, we also test all of the gold. So uh, X-ray spectrography is what you see here, uh, ultrasound, electric conductivity testing and so on. These are all ways which we've developed a system to uh, test it against the tolerance database and basically certify that this specific parcel is indeed genuine gold or silver. So they get parcelized and they go inside these pallet cages. The whole facility is offline. Uh, the vaulting system was actually developed by uh, myself and two additional <coughs> developers. And because we put so much, so many checks and balances in it, we managed to get a very good insurance, uh, which I'll get to next. Mm. But yeah, so this will give you a little bit of an idea of the facilities that, that um, Colin was talking about earlier. Mm. Go on. Okay, so if you run your own vault, and, and we are quite unique in running on vault because typically the tendency is to, for a vault to uh, want to have as many clients as possible. And once you are both a bullion dealer and the vault, nobody else wants to store with you because they'll see you as a competitor. But if you do that, you can customize a lot more things. And so uh, one of the key things is insurance, uh, the testing of bullion, and as a process I'm going towards. We also enabled us to do safe deposit boxes, which has some interesting advantages from a tax perspective, which I'll come in later. And peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, which we'll get to. <coughs> this brings me to my other uh, 
class or a problem class that I had when I was storing with a commercial vault operator, which was this um, statement. The vault shall not be liable under any circumstance whatsoever for a shortage or mysterious disappearance or unexplained loss uh, to the goods that to be contained by the parcels. So you're storing this gold somewhere, you're paying insurance, they're telling you, oh, don't worry, it's all insured, as long as it doesn't mysteriously disappear. Now, this is a real thing, and you have to understand when you buy bullion, oftentimes the dealer will tell you, don't worry, it's got all risk insurance. And all risk insurance is just a technical term. It means all risk included unless excluded. So if you don't know the list of exclusions, you really don't know what it is. But even the vault dealer oftentimes might think, oh, it means everything included because they don't know any better. So once you dig deeper and you look at it, it's a small print of a storage contract, you know, you will find all of these things. The reason why mysterious disappearance is such a big issue is if you're the vault operator and something gets stolen, normally you need a police report. You file the police report, you give it to the insurance company, the insurance company will then pay for the loss. But if something disappears, you don't know why, you can't really go to the police. I mean, you go to the police and say, I thought I had 10 bars and now I only have eight. What's the police going to do? Right? If you don't have a police report, what are you going to do with the insurance company? So they're going to say, well, show me how it got stolen. So because of this, the vault would send pass the risk back over to the customer and say, if it mysteriously disappears, you know, too bad. Uh, in our case, we actually managed to get a $300 million insurance covering mysterious disappearance. And the reason we got it was because we put so much effort into, say, checks and procedures uh, of the vaulting system that the insurance actually saw us as a, as, a, as a risk worth taking. And being a small company, you know, I kind of felt it was a impor very important thing to basically to, to have. And, and we got it. So we got some of the best insurance out there, as well as being only subject to single jurisdiction. So the next thing is testing. Uh, we Normally, when you want to test bullion, your know, idea was you just melt it down and then you know exactly what it was, but of course it's destroyed. Uh, in practice, you, uh, in the industry, you might see maple leaf boxes. And these maple leaf boxes, you know, dealers would normally say, oh, they are sealed. Because they are sealed, we don't need to open it. But the problem with these boxes is it's just a little plastic strip, which you can reapply with a $200 machine. So, what we decided is when we store something, we are going to store it on an authenticated basis. So whatever uh, boxes we get, we will actually be cutting it open, we will be testing a uh, sample number of coins, and we will be re resealing it with a strapping machine. Um, what this means is that since everything is authenticated, we can provide instant liquidity. If you buy bullion from us and you want to sell it back to us, there's no question as to whether it's real or fake or whatever it is, it's real. You can transfer in the bullion to us. You might be storing it at your home or somewhere else. We will test it. If there's some issue, we'll send it to your bag along with a video of us testing it. Otherwise, it will go into storage and you can sell it on your point of time or use the P2P. And you'll get a report which will look something like this uh, with the different tests being done. By doing at least three different tests, you basically have near certainty. A density test itself, for example, uh, is not going to be that strong an option, but doing an X-ray, doing a density, and doing an electric conductivity or ultrasound gives you near perfect accuracy and certainty. Next, okay. So sort of summarizing the first section of the presentation, uh, we are doing segregated ownership. Uh, when people, when you hear the term fully allocated, that just means that you're being owed gold and that whoever owes you gold is supposed to have enough gold to back that IOU. Um, you probably want segregated ownership for real long-term systemic protection. <coughs> Jurisdictionally, yeah, yeah, I'll speed up. Um, in our case, we are just in Singapore as opposed to having the global problem. Uh, it is authenticated, we have mysterious disappearance, and from a reporting perspective, we are not considered a financial institution. We have zero reporting requirements whatsoever. So it really comes back down to the customer 
uh, to do cell reporting depending on the jurisdiction where they live in. Uh, could I, Susan, could I get you to do the, the link of the P2P? Since we're running short on time, uh, I want to put, give you an idea of what the peer-to-peer -peer system is. Um, essentially, we had a customer who said that he needed cash, but he didn't want to sell his gold. Can we give him a loan? His answer was no back then, because we weren't a money license, uh, licensed money lender. So we tried to figure out a way of doing it, and we basically created this peer-to-peer -peer system whereby one customer can lend or borrow with another customer. And this system here, uh, if you go down a little bit more, will show you the duration uh, for the loan, for example, 12 months. So, uh, yeah. so this will be a 12-month loan. OK, it's a bit hard to. Can you push it a little bit to the left? Do you see it all? <coughs> OK, basically, we have a bid and ask system. Four times per month, on the 1st, the 8th, the 15th, the 23rd, loans become due. <coughs> Uh, if you're a borrower and you say you own $100,000 worth of gold, you can get a loan of up to $50,000 from another customer, which means we have 200% collateral ratio. Uh, during the duration of that loan, if it ever falls below 110, we liquidate the bullion, make sure that the lender gets the principal and interest back. So it makes it for a very safe system. Because it's so safe, the lenders are typically willing to offer pretty low interest rates. So in this case, we're looking at a live uh, uh, loan right now. Anybody can go and, and see this online. But you can see there's a person here offering a $200,000 loan. He's willing to pay 4% to be getting 8,000 USD in interest. Our fee is half a percent, which will be $1,000. And the $200,000 loan is uh, covered by 399,000 US dollars worth of bullion in the form of 47 different parcels. And if you would go to one of these, one of these bars, you would actually be able to see the photo of the parcel, uh, the current valuation, which is real time. And if you go down a little bit, you would actually see a portion of the history of this actual parcel, because it's all being tracked on a parcel by parcel basis. With this system, you can basically t uh, get a loan for 50% of whatever you're storing with us in a matter of minutes. Um, or you can be a lender, meaning you can lend, say, $200,000 to somebody, get $8,000 worth of interest, knowing that you have 200% backing of physical gold, which is fully insured stored in Singapore. If the borrower wants to roll over the, the bullion at the end instead of paying back the loan. The, a week before expiration, they can roll over and get a different loan. So you can really keep on doing this indefinitely if you want. And if the borrower were to be late in paying back the loans, we have what's called a sweeper fund. Essentially, we do a, a, a day loan to the borrower to make sure the lender gets the money back on time. And we charge a late fee to the borrower for the amount we lend them, it's the amount of 1%. Uh, which then goes back into sweeper fund, which basically makes sweeper fund bigger and bigger over time and ensuring that we can accommodate more and more late payments. So far, we, had not, we haven't had a single late payment. Uh, we had 1,680 contracts or so, doing about three or four of these a day, and a volume of, in US dollar terms, about 33 million or so. Uh, so that's what we did in the last one and a half years. And I expect by next year for it to take off a lot more because we have two new uh, borrowing sources, uh, two new programs where we think we're going to have borrowing demand, basically. We have a shortage of borrowers. We have an overabundance of lenders. Um, we had one customer who had $2.5 million of silver, for example. He got a loan for 1.2 million, 4.5%. Used that to buy Bitcoin when it was 600. Now the thing went up to over $5,000. Now he's starting to come back, buy more bullion, get on the salon. I'm not sure what he's going to do with it, but you know, these are some of the things uh, that we're doing. We do accept Bitcoin. We are looking at Bitcoin as a form of payment. So you can buy in Bitcoin, you can sell in Bitcoin. And uh, we also have a program towards launching a, a, a crypto storage 
whereby uh, we can basically create uh, uh, an account for you and materialize it. What I mean with this, we are going to have a laser to a laser edge, a private key, and have that stored in a safe deposit box, which basically is a complicated way of saying that we can provide very safe storage of bitcoins as well as gold and silver. We see demand of people going in that direction. And as was mentioned earlier, people who go into gold and silver see a portion of that clientele also tends to go towards Bitcoin. And we feel it's important to embrace that sort of uh, activity rather than trying to resist it. And given that we are very technologically sort of a friendly company, you know, we're sort of moving in that direction as well. Um, could you close uh, for this one? Mm. So I'm, I'm nearly done uh, at five. Mm. Okay. Well, that pretty much concludes what I wanted to show. I just wanted to share this image with you, which I think summarizes things beautifully. Um, you know, you might have your nest egg, but when we're talking about systemic risk, whereas the financial system itself is at risk, uh, if you're on that truck, you know, it doesn't matter where your nest egg is, uh, you want to make sure you have a little bit of eggs out, away from the truck itself. So, can we go to questions? <laughs> Yeah, please. Can you guys uh, store platinum? Yes. How would I get my gold from North America to Singapore? Um, Lumis, for example, or Prinks, we can organize the shipping. You just need to tell us where it is. Uh, so basically two ways, either with a precious metal company like this, or we, if it's a small amount, we can use FedEx. Uh, we have a specialized insurance which goes with the FedEx or UPS. Then we can ship it from there as well. So depending on amounts, you just let us know and we'll figure out the logistics for you. Mm. Yep. Uh, what are the tax implications for like making a withdrawal and transferring out of country to like say the states? Okay, so I had a lot of questions actually on you know what's taxable, what's not taxable, and so on. Um, half of the tax advisors I spoke with in the U.S. told me this stuff is non-taxable because it's a physical item. Half, it's not because it's not a financial uh, interface, it's more like a, say, uh, a painting or so. Uh, the other half is telling me it is like a financial account because you can sell something online. By virtue of selling it, you know, it, is, uh, it becomes reportable um, on, on the form. So essentially, what is taxable or is not taxable is more or less up to you and to your jurisdiction. We built the reports so that it's easy for you to report. Uh, but us not being a financial institution, we don't have any reporting requirements. So we don't fall under FATCA, we don't fall under OECD. Um, and it's really up to the customer to do his reporting. Yep. Uh, have you ever issued any equity in which, how you value the business currently? It, that can be a, a side question. I'm just <laughs> I'm interested, um, <laughs> okay. and if there's a piece of you that's for sale, I'll first put my hand up and say I want some of this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, we are sort of a strange company in a way because we, we never got outside investor money, and we never got any loans, because I just ran this business out of my bedroom when I had enough money, and I started, you know, sort of uh, increasing it. But I very much like to get people on. Um, in the company who are bringing something to the company. So for example, most of our long-term employees are shareholders. Because when you are a co-owner of the company, you have a different relationship with it. And it makes for a much better, more effective sort of uh, working environment. Um, so right now, we are, we are um, not really looking for outside investments. And I don't know what to do with the money if I were to get it. That's really my problem because if somebody were to throw two million dollars at me, how would I best deploy it? You know, so that might change. But right now, I don't have, I don't have a a, a big need for additional cash, so to speak. Mm. <laughs> Please, yeah. Uh, 
Um, so if I understand correctly, you're asking whether we can take the peer-to-peer -peer system and use, say, Bitcoin as collateral as opposed to gold. Correct. Uh, once we launch, launch our crypto storage service, that's one of the things I'm looking at potentially doing. But because it's so volatile, it will probably only be, it will probably require 400% collateral. Because we don't want to be in a situation where somebody is borrowing against, say, Bitcoin, and Bitcoin ends up falling 80% and us having to liquidate it because nobody really wants to be in a situation. So we, we always prefer to err on the side of caution. But yes, if we were to do that, and that's why I mentioned, uh, you know, we probably might have a lot more borrowing demand next year because I don't know of many places which allow uh, borrowing against Bitcoin and, and we will be doing it. Uh, it's just that before we do something like this, we need to be 110% sure that that Bitcoin indeed is safely stored and cannot be hacked. And, and that's what we are testing right now. So that will be a follow-up program, so. Yep. Sorry, one more question. So if your uh, network is off, like off the grid and not connected to the public, how are you going to handle the deposits of cryptocurrency? Oh, that's very easy. If you, if you understand blockchain, uh, essentially, the private key gets generated in what we call the blue system, which is an offline system. It immediately gets encrypted and then it gets laser etched on a piece of polycarbonate plastic. And this card then goes in a safe deposit box. Now, with these bitcoins, you need to have a private key to send out money. So that's the thing you have to keep really secret. And nobody knows it, not even the customer, until you request for delivery. And then you have what's called the address, which you can think of like a bank account number. Now, we send the address to the customer, and once it opens, the customer can send bitcoins into his address whenever he wants. So it's only when he needs to take it out that we need to, to, um, to basically close the storage account. We have a whole process of decrypting it, authenticating the customer, and then giving the the bitcoins back to the customer. If it is locked up with a peer-to-peer -peer system, then we would have to clear the loan first before that can be closed. Good. Any more questions? Uh, I'm available. You can ask me any time here. I love to talk about this stuff. Um, so thank you very much. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?